We go through uh, entire books of the Bible, and we're at 1 Samuel, and we are covering all of 1 Samuel, but now we're at chapter 8. So it's a longer chapter to read, but you should be thankful because we're doing an entire chapter, (laughs) right? So let me read the word of God over us today. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you're old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. And he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said no. But there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go, every man, to his city. God's word. You can be seated. Now, when I first came to this uh, chapter, I thought, It's a lot of, uh, it's a longer chapter, but there's not a lot in there to talk about. And of course, after studying it for a couple days, I'm like, okay, I'm wrong about that again. Um, But some texts you chop up into three or four sermons, and some like this, we're going to cover the entire thing. And uh, what I want to do is I want to cover, I think, more quickly the text, just go through to make sure we pull out some points that are there to talk about. But then at the end, I want to get, I think, to the larger point or narrative um, structure that I think the scripture is pointing to for this text. So uh, let's just jump right in. <clears throat> Chapter 8 begins with a problem, okay? So the problem, at first, they're saying Samuel is old. Now, if you notice, time is moving really fast in our scripture. He was in utero and then uh, weaned at three or four, all in chapter one. The next time we see him in chapter three, he's a very young man or teenager. And it says, and he continues to grow up. In chapter seven, he's advanced 20 years from that. And that was just last week. And he mediates over Israel. They repent to God and they await for their salvation. It's kind of a high point in his life. He gets to have it like 40 or so. And now, one flip of the page into chapter 8, and it says he's an old man. <laughs> he's suddenly old, and he's, he's only therefore highlighted as significant biblically during his lifetime two or three times, and now he's old. Um, and I just want to say that that doesn't mean that his entire life was insignificant. Okay, And in this world of social media, um, when it seems to our kids like people can become famous or infamous probably in a day or two or even a week, I think it's a true countercultural message to tell our kids about how to be faithful. That's really one of the points, probably the first point I want to make, is to be faithful in the small things over a long period of time. That's really what life is about. Most of life is actually spent sleeping, eating, and going to the bathroom. And for some of you, those ratios differ, right? Um, 
And I thought about Samuel and his life, and I thought how much of his life was spent walking, right? Packing up a donkey, going to this town or that, talking to this person or that person about a disagreement, uh, cleaning up, uh, taking some baths, finding rivers to drink from, moving in and out of small villages. Um, he, uh, he, we suddenly realize he's found a wife, right? We didn't know that. Uh, he's had children, and they've grown up. And if you're a parent, you know how time really can just get past you. Once just raising children, you're like, I'm great at 28. Next thing you know, you're like, I'm really uh, tired at 58. Like, what happened? And um, so he's done that. And then he's probably worked in the garden around his house. He's repaired things, right? The roof. He's uh, planted a garden. He's, he's weeded and picked fruit. You, like, that's... That's life, is what I'm saying. That's a faithful life. And sometimes we read scripture and we forget that. A faithful life is small things over a long time. We've had to go over this with our kids a lot. Because kids nowadays are like, I can't wait to grow up and change the world. And you're like, well, let's start with your room. (laughs) Make your bed, right? Pick up your stuff. Do your laundry. Um, uh, Let's start there. Um, and, and there's other things, like you know, call a friend, take a walk, unload the dishwasher, have dinner with us, help us make dinner today, right? Sit around, let's... I have twins in college now. Aiden and Allie are in college. One's at Clemson, one's at Anderson. One is working his way to become a doctor, and the other one to, to be a lawyer, which is great, because I'm going to need both in my life, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and some days, they're working their way towards that, and it's a long trek, Right? And, it, and th- things on the ground in front of them are hard. The car has, makes noises. It's not the car I want. And they jump ahead, and it's not the food I want. They're eating ramen noodles, whatever it is. It's hard. And, and, and it's easy for them to go, boy, I can't wait to get to that job. That's what I want. And be in that city doing that thing I want to do uh, and be done with all of this. The, the hard work, the boring papers, another test, another study, another paper, another late night with this roommate who's noisy, right? And, and we remind them to be faithful, faithful to get that old car an oil change, faithful to the homework, to the study, to, to making their bed. Maybe they'll feel better to clean their room, do their laundry, call a friend, take a walk, uh, go take a hike. To take a drink. Like, because that's life. It's not the high big moments. It's just being faithful in the boring day-to-day stuff. And that's what Samuel's been doing. The Bible doesn't want to highlight because it doesn't need to, but that's what his life is like. And even as a church, I think um, some might say, y'all are boring. And I'm like, what does that mean? Well, you, it's like preach and pray. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> it seems like that's what we're supposed to do. It's like, you guys don't have like circuses or anything. It's like, you can't pet animals up there, like lights on us and all kinds of, you know, funny things. No, uh, it, we're just trying to be faithful to God. So Samuel's old now and he's their mediator. They love him. They like him. He's doing a good job, but they see that the end is drawing near. And so they begin to look for a succession plan. And that's the second problem. The second problem is the succession plan that is in place is a bad one. Um, Samuel's two sons, Joel and Abijah, in the Bible aren't depicted as horribly as Hophni and Phinehas, right? But they're also not depicted much better either. And Samuel has already anointed them as the next judges over Israel in line to succeed him, and that's a problem. And so the elders, right, the wise elders of the tribes, they come together and they agree that that's not what they want. The memories of Hophni and Phinehas and this kind of succession plan are too fresh. And that's really my second point. Spirituality or leadership in spirituality cannot be handed down. Um, There were hereditary positions in Israel. For instance, the priesthood. You had to come from the line of Aaron. But the son in the priesthood was often not like the father. They were corrupt, oftentimes. In fact, it became so corrupt that close to the time of Jesus, they were appointed, chosen by lot instead of by sons. And then uh, the Sanhedrin would appoint the high priest. It was, a, it was an ugly thing. It seldom worked to just say, oh, yeah, this is a good spiritual leader, so therefore let's give it to their children. Um, and you can see that all through the Old Testament, right? You have Abraham who God called out of sin, and then you have Isaac, and you're like, oh, this, this might work until you get 
Jacob and Esau, which come out of Isaac, and both of them are a mess. Both of them, uh, incredibly um, terrible kids. And then Jacob, where the line follows, has 12, and they're all messy. Even Joseph, at an early age, his family was messing up. Like he had to get out of there for God to make a different person. And that's how it always is. And then you have Moses, right? Moses is the next great leader. And you're like, well, then his sons should. But his sons don't. Gershom and Eleazar, they disappear off the scene. We don't know what happened to them. But Joshua, who's not his son, becomes the next leader because they were following a better line. It's not just handing it down. And the judges, by the way, even though the priesthood could do that uh, hereditarily, the judges weren't supposed to do that. God raises up judges at just the right time. And as you see, Samuel had appointed his two sons to be judges. So when the people rise up and they say, we need a different leader because Samuel, you're as good as dead. I mean, that couldn't, that couldn't have felt good, but they're like, you're as good as dead. We know how this works. We see how slow you're walking up the steps, right? <laughs> or wherever you're going. And their last one got so old that he just fell off a chair and broke his neck and died. So they don't know when that's going to happen. And they know two sons, they don't want to lead. So they say, hey, as, as good elders would, will do, uh, let's have a plan here in place. Okay? And so um, they, they were right to feel that way, by the way, the, the elders, that this shouldn't just be passed down to your sons. It was Spurgeon, I think, who said, and you have to think about it for a while, but he says, people go to hell in hand baskets, but to heaven one by one. And what he means, I think, and as I've thought about it, is that you, you not only can, but you will pass on sin and rebellion to your kids, right? You'll see it in them and say, oh, that's me. Usually I'll try to say, oh, that's you, Heather. <laughs> and she's like, no, that's you. I'm like, oh, okay, that's me. Um, but you, you'll pass that down. You don't have to do anything. But you cannot pass down faith. You can't pass down brokenness and humility and submission and the Lord's movement in somebody's life. And, and I know this could upset some people in here, but I think there's good reason to be incredibly suspicious of hereditary or family spiritual leadership. I do not like churches when the husband and wife are team leaders of the church. I just don't. I don't trust it, Right? I, don't, I, I question it. I'm highly skeptical of church leadership that gets handed down from a father to a son. A father builds a church and then hands it to the son and he takes over. Like that, none of that ever really works. So I just want you to know that if my son, Aiden, decides not to do what he's doing and wants to become the executive pastor here and I say, yes, sorry, Chad, um, or my daughter says, I really want to go into ministry and I make her the family pastor, sorry, Josh, or Heather, which, by the way, you need to start calling first lady, right? <laughs> she's shaking her head like, no. If suddenly she's preaching because she's my wife, like, if I were you, I would head to the exit. This is not how spiritual leadership works. God picks people who have been deeply wounded, who have broken hips like Jacob, right? Who walk with a limp, who have a cane spiritually, are submissive in their spirit, who have been tamed by God and haven't tried to tame God. And then why does he do that? To surprise us with his glory. So we say, I can't believe you chose that one. That's the point. That's why God always says, it's like, you're chosen, you're not choice. And, and by the way, he loves to see our mess mixed with his wonderful, we talked about that last week, this blue and red Play-Doh and it comes together and you get gospel purple. And that's what God wants to do. And you just, you can't just hand that down. It has to happen. And if church is a business, by the way, then we could pick church leaders differently. You could just pass it down. But then we don't get to see gospel purple. We need spiritual leadership from Christians who I like to say, who have had their scales clawed off by Aslan, right? Who have been hurt by God and now respect and fearfully love him. So back to our story. The people don't want Samuel to pass down leadership to his son. So they get together and they request a king. And they request a king to judge, to judge us like all the nations. And God pulls out that phrase that they want the king to judge them 
to show us why Samuel is really upset because they want to find a replacement for Samuel. He's their judge. And they want, they want to find his replacement before he dies. And then they want to leave out his dear, beautiful sons from a succession plan. So here's another point. The elders get together, and I think they rightly identify the problem, but they try to solve it in human ways. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong, again, with them noticing um, that there's an issue here, right? The elders come together. They rightfully see a problem. The problem is how they try to solve it. Notice how closely their attitude aligns with the chapter 4 Israelites and not the chapter 7 Israelites. The chapter 4 Israelites, the elders get together. There's a problem. We're getting our, you know, bottoms kicked. So what are we going to do? We've talked. We've got an, we've got an answer. Here's how we're going to solve the problem. We've got to figure it out. Go get the ark. The chapter 7 Israelites are saying, we have a problem. God, we're sorry. We repent before you. Please show us your way. How do we move forward? How do you move us forward? How do we show your glory? What do you want us to do? Give us an answer, God. So as you can see easily, this feels more like chapter 4 Israelites, not the chapter 7 Israelites. They're demanding not an ark here, but they're demanding a king because they figured it out. They're not saying, Samuel, this is the problem. Let's pray about it together. Samuel's upset. And he's upset because he feels like they're rejecting his leadership. And maybe there's some personal insecurity here. Some of the commentators talk about that. We don't know for sure. Maybe there's some deep agitation and not being able to provide leadership roles and secure his son's futures. Again, we can't be sure. But what we are sure of is that although Samuel's upset by this request and he doesn't want to do it, he also takes all of his feelings to the Lord. Is that clear? Samuel doesn't like the request. He would have said no outright. But he also knows that he's not the one that needs to speak into this. So whatever God wants to do is more important to Samuel. And I guess that's our fourth point here, is how much we need to align our feelings with truth through prayer and the word. Because, my friends, and especially my brothers and sisters who are Christians in here, your feelings are probably not aligned with God. We think they are because we say, okay, I'm a Christian. And so that means however I feel, I feel after that. So if I'm horrified by something, God must be horrified. If I think something is awful, then God must think it's awful. If this thing really brings me joy, then I think that's what God thinks. But nine times out of ten, you're in a sanctification process And your culture is the thing that has trained you to feel how you feel. And you don't even know it. You just feel it. And you say, well, I'm a Christian, so I guess this is right. But we aren't allowed as Christians to just feel what we feel. That's just one of the reasons, by the way, our prayer life is so important. And we see it here because Samuel thinks this is an awful idea, but he also wants to align with God. God, okay. All right, he hates it. But what do you have to say? What is your answer to their request? Uh, uh, He's not even saying, God, this is what I think we should do. He's saying, I'm submitting to your will. I'm waiting to hear from you. What do we do? And and by the way, y'all, to be Christian, this is how you were saved. Because you had a savior in a garden who didn't just go with his feelings. Who said, not my will, Father, thine be done. So if he's going to struggle with his feelings, guess what? You're really going to struggle with feelings, and you have to take them to the Lord. So God says, this is Don Logan paraphrase, Samuel, uh, do what they want to do, and kind of, by the way, quit pouting about it, because they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me, so it's not about you, and by the way, now he's bringing them into the inner circle, this is what they do. You know, they always do this. They've always done this. Since I brought them out of Egypt to this day, people don't really want me to lead them. They don't really want me to love them. They want what they want, what they want. So buck up, buddy, Samuel, because you're being rejected because you are representing me. And so therefore, your suffering isn't unique. It's actually common. It's actually inevitable, Samuel. It's in the job description. You want to represent me? This is part of it. People's feelings are going to hurt you. But tell them at least how bad it will be with a king. 
So God's already said, do this. And God's kind of done with the conversation, but warn them how bad it's going to be. Now, if you look at verses 11 through 18, Samuel tells them how bad it's going to be. And, it, and it, again, it kind of feels like God was asking Samuel to just give them a warning and then do what they asked to do. But Samuel, you can tell, is trying to convince them to change their mind. You see, he wants a different outcome. But if you go through those verses, one word sticks out when it comes to this king or the kings. And the word is take. The king takes. It's over and over again through the scripture. And I think God wants us to see that. The king will take your sons. The king will take your daughters. The king will take your fields. The king will take your vineyards and your olive orchards. In other words, the king will take your land. He will take a tenth of the produce of the land that's not his. He will take your male servants. He will take your female servants. He will take a tenth of your flocks. Are you getting the picture? Samuel's saying, you want a king because you think the king is going to give you something, but the king is going to take something because kings are takers. They're not givers. And to that prophetic voice, the people disagree. They say, no, you're not our boss. That's essentially what they say. We shall have a king is what they say. You're not going to stop us. We were just asking you to be nice. We want a king to be like the other nations. This king will be our judge, and he will go out and fight our battles. And that last statement just shows how painfully hurtful hurtful people can be to not only other people, but especially to God. You know, we say there's nothing new under the sun. Have you ever heard the phrase, what have you done for me lately? That's exactly how people are. It's as old as life itself. If I was Samuel, I would have kept this conversation going probably in my sin. I would have said, wait a second, you want a king to fight for you? Are you kidding me? The ark of God did more damage to the Philistines than all you all put together. Did God need a king when he went into enemy territory, into the strongholds, and destroyed the Philistines so much that they kicked God back out, they couldn't stand him anymore? Did a king do that for you? No, I don't think so. Hey, come on. I want everybody now, this whole group, to walk over me to this rock that we called Ebenezer. Now, I know it's been a couple of day, decades, so you probably forget, but I'm sure, Mom and Dad, you've talked to your kids about this rock. Why is this rock here? Did a king win the battle that day in chapter 7? Who fought for you? Did a king, did a king thunder from the heavens and destroy the army? How, how could you? You need a king to fight for you? What about Jericho? Was it some king who knocked down those walls for you? Who was the king who fought for you in Egypt? See, that's God says ever since then. Which king brought down plagues and disease and horror and death? Where's that crown? Tell me. That's why God's saying, they're rejecting me. They don't want to trust me for salvation. They don't want to bend their knee and say, I'm sorry. They don't want to submit to me. They want to end around to just get to some leadership who will do what God's supposed to do. God's supposed to fight for his people, the Bible said. So Samuel goes back to God. He's upset. He's disappointed. But again, he faithfully tells God what the people have said. And so God tells him a second time. This time, I think, more clearly, end of conversation. I told you already. Obey their voice and give them a king. And it's almost like God is saying that. Like, I, I, you, Why are you coming back to me? I said, give them a king and just warn them. It sounds like you want me to change my mind. So no, they want a king, obey what they say, do what they want to say. So then here's the big moment. Samuel comes out of the tent, goes to the people, and you expect him to repeat God's word. Okay, God said you could have a king. And, ah, or he does that, I don't know, that Caesar thing in a movie where he does this. And, ah, and, then, boom, and they scream, yes, we get a king. And... and It looks to me like Samuel just, like we know what he's going to do, don't we? We know he's faithful, but they don't know what he's going to do. So it looks like he just doesn't want to give them immediate satisfaction to me. And so can you imagine this whole crowd gathered? They've been asking for this. They came to this place out of respect. They're all waiting. They're eating. They're having their own you know, parking lot picnic waiting for news. He's gone into the tent one time. He came out and gave them. And he's gone into a tent a second time. Oh, he's in there for a while. And then he comes out again. And, okay, okay, okay. and the crowd starts getting up again. Okay, he's here. Samuel, tell us what he said. Yes, Samuel. And the little kid's yelling, tell us what 
he said, Samuel. And then the elders start trying to shuffle it like, so they can hear. And then Samuel raises his hand like this, and everybody gets quiet. You can hear a cricket. Just quiet. And then he says, get off my lawn. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly what he says. He's like such an old man now. He's like, go home. Just go. And that's the end of the chapter. <laughs> that's the story. Now we're going to find out that he will obey, but he's going to wait on the Lord. So now that's the story. What I want to do now is lift this plane off the ground in just our last 10 minutes or so, so we can see the larger context of the story, because there's some lessons that we can walk through on the ground. I think they're small, smaller lessons, and we've done that for a little bit. But I think the larger narrative context of the chapter is that for the first time in all of Israel's history, there's this huge off-ramp from where they've been going to a monarchy, a big highway, and they take it, and God allows it. And from this point on, there's only going to be kings. We're going to be talking about kings. For the rest of the Old Testament, there's, there's kings, and we're going to be talking about Saul, and then we're going to be talking about David and his kingship, and we're going to be talking about how the crown, you know, one ring to rule them all, right? This is the point that that happens. But there's a huge question over the text. And the question is this, and it's not clearly answered, but let me give you the question. Did God want the Israelites to have a king or not? And, and maybe you don't care about that. Maybe that's just like a theology question, but it's huge for me. It's like, did God want this? Because I don't know about you, but I was raised to believe that he didn't, and he relented and gave him one, that this wasn't actually God's plan for Israel. And if all we have is this text of God allowing it, telling him what a bad ideal it is, then we could say God didn't really want that, but he loved them, and, and uh, that's what he did. But did God actually desire and plan for Israel to have a king? And the answer to that is clearly yes. God wanted and desired and planned for Israel to have a king. It had been prophesied over them for so many years. Did you know that this is what God said to Abraham in chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 6? God said to Abraham, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Jacob, on his deathbed, prophesying in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, says this to Judah, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. He's talking about a king that's going to come from Judah's line. So they're all, they feel, yes, we're supposed to do this at some point. And then Moses prophesies about a king, and it's actually prophesying about this very moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 and following, Moses says this, When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, which is this land, and you possess it and dwell in it, which they are, not fully, but they're there with Samuel, I will set a king, and you say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me. So even clearly talking about their bad motivations. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Maybe that's a little different, but we'll see that it's not. Now, now what happens here is God goes on to say in that scripture, if you want to read Deuteronomy 17 later, that this king shouldn't be a taker, should be a giver, should be a servant, a different type of king. That he should not take wives, he should not take horses, he should not take chariots. Um, in fact, he would have to write himself his own book from the law. Like, you know, like, you know you learn more when you write something down, right? And so it says this king has to take the book of law, write it down himself, and then keep his own book and keep looking at it every day. And then I love this because we talk about humility a lot here. It says, and his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers. See, a servant, a giver, a different type of king. And so to answer this question, let me just give you my take on God's heart as a way to answer this question. Here's what I think. I think what God is saying is this. When you say you want a king like the other nations, I'm going to allow it. Just make sure that he's not a king like the other nations. Does that make sense? Why? Because God's saying, I do not want an authority that's separate from me. You won't be able to survive that. I want a king that rules under me and submits to me and listens to my voice. And so therefore he will submit and listen to you and serve you. 
So yes, God had approved and preordained a monarchy for Israel. And there are echoes of this need for a king all through the book of Judges. Um, it's, it, I think it's mostly why the book of Judges is there. If you've, ever, if you've never read the book of Judges, make sure you're a mature Christian before you do. That's all I gotta say. It's terrible, it's ugly, it's dark. Um, and there's a lot of depressing, sinful stories. And God raises up judges in the book of Judges, and even the judges that God raises up are awful people. Even the good ones that they think are good ones, like Jephthah, who kills his own daughter. Samson, right? A thug and a, a womanizing thug. And, and then you go, oh, well, Gideon's great. Well, he was vengeful, if you read his story. He lacks faith many times. He makes himself rich, and it wasn't allowed. Like, it was terrible what Gideon did. It's, all, it's, it's an awful mess, and the best leaders that God raises up are not great people at all. And so I think the point of judges is judge not, right? Maybe that's what should be the title of this. And so the people keep longing for better through the book of Judges. Chapter 17, verse 6. In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Joshua 18, 1. In those days Israel had no king. Joshua 19, 1. In those days Israel had no king. The last scripture in Judges, Judges, uh, uh, sorry, Judges 21, 25. In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Those are all of the scriptures through Judges. See, the, the, the Bible's teeing you up for this event in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's been about 450 years since there was a unifying leader in Israel named Joshua. And now Samuel has kind of done that for Israel. He's brought all the tribes together. But Samuel now turns to his system, my sons, and they're saying, no, we think we should turn to a different system. And they're hopeful that this kingship, this monarchy, will take care of all the problems. All the sin, all the mess, all the fighting, all the wars, all the disorganization, the administration that we need, we need this thing to run more smoothly, we need a king. Israel's request for a king was perfectly reasonable. The elders got their heads together, and this solution, I think, makes sense. It makes perfect sense. It was within the permissive will of God. And yet Yahweh, our God, tells us that he views this, views this as rejecting his kingship. And so here's, I think, my last point. It means that when we get together and we solve problems, right? Right? Are you with me? And we try to solve problems because we see problems. Most of the time, our ideas and solutions can be perfectly rational, politically wise, expedient, prudent, pragmatic, and utterly godless. Because we have a tendency to look at our problems mechanically. Where's the breakdown? Let's just get that fixed. Let's take this piece out, put that piece in. Everything keeps running on the, on the you know, conveyor belt. Replace this piece and let that piece go. And, and let's just keep figuring this out because we're, we, that's what we should do. It should run right. That's the first mistake. And I should be uh, able to figure it out. So, so we're going to enter the beginning of this monarchy. And we're going to have to keep asking ourselves because I'm not going to keep bringing it up. But I want you to study and think as we're moving through it, is this any better? Is this getting any better? Does Saul make it better? Does David make it better? Because Samuel is right. Even the best of kings and the best they ever had was David will take and not give. And I wish we could cue up an actual photo of Bathsheba and Uriah, her husband. Even the best kings take and don't give. And God keeps telling us the same story over and over again in different ways, in different times, through different stories, through different mediums, through different people. Telling this story in the Bible, the story that we have to know, brothers and sisters, because Abraham wasn't good. He wasn't good enough. We can't look at Abraham and say, Father Abraham, right? Like he's this beautiful father. He was, a, he was awful in many ways, and he failed again and again. And then Jacob, oh my gosh, Jacob. Yeah, terrible. And then Jacob becomes Israel. Judah, the lion, terrible. Moses couldn't do it. Like the, the Israelites would still probably consider Moses as the greatest leader. Moses was a reluctant murderer who didn't really want to be the leader, became the prophet and priest, 
but then turned a lot over to Aaron and then couldn't even get himself into the promised land, let alone others. Failed so much, God said, you can't go in. And then the judges come after that. And it's like they fail and fall over and over and over again. And so you see the people crying out now and say, oh, this is awful. Hey, John, idea, we need a king. That's it. A king will fix all these problems. And Saul will fail and David will fail. And Solomon The greatest, most unifying time in the history of Israel is when Solomon was leading. And so if you're somebody who likes results, it's Solomon. But Solomon was apostate, morally bankrupt, and lost. And the system didn't work because he died, and the entire nation followed him into apostasy. God telling the same story over and over and over again. It's not going to work. Your ways are not going to work. Your ways, your ideas aren't going to be enough your education, the systems, the governments. Why? Because all of those have people in them. Amen? Why was, you know, people, uh, the flood. It's like, let's get rid of all the evil in the world. Flood. Right after the flood, evil starts to spread. Say, well, what happened? I, you know what happened. On the boat, there were people. Uh, all of the things you're going to see in the Old Testament don't work. A lamb slaughtered on one night in Egypt over my door. Fine. What about the next day? And the next and the next. And the blood is everywhere. The sea parting for a people one time in one place, it's not going to be enough. What about all the generations before? What about me today? What about you? Is the sea going to part? The tabernacle, great idea. But one place, an actual place you had to go to, where there's one person who gets to go see God one time a year, that's not going to work. How do I get to God? A box? That box, oh, 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 right? You're holding it with the sticks. There's this awesome, you know, incense, whatever. It's it's just beautiful. Like, there's a word of God in the box, and that's really cool. But it didn't do it for him. It didn't work. What would it be like if the word came out of the box and came alive? What would it be like if the word started to walk around and talk? Maybe, maybe that would be different. What would it be like if the word became the tabernacle? So there's not one place anymore. It's wherever the word is. And what would it be like if the word became the one high priest that we need who could make the one sacrifice we need once and for all and forever? And what if there was a word who became a lamb that we killed Once, and there was never payment again. And what if we had a word that became a judge who was actually righteous, a real, actual hero who would fight our battles for us, not just now, not just again and again, but once and for all, the main battle, done. And what would it be, what would it be like to have a king who isn't like the other kings at all, who doesn't look or act like one at all, who rides a humble donkey, who isn't wealthy, who doesn't take our sons and daughters, a kind of king who makes food for thousands instead of taking food for himself. What if he didn't take it all? What if he did nothing but give? And what if, because of that, you didn't recognize your king? What if this king stood on his little... Jesus, he couldn't have been big. This little guy, dirty feet, torn, raggedy, poor clothes, and he stands in a temple and he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. I'm the king. Would you believe that guy or would you want to kill him like they did? He's not very impressive. And the story being told over and over and over and over and over again is we keep looking for things or people to save us and we can't do it. We can't save ourselves. We can't save others. But we do need a prophet and we do need a word and we do need a priest and we do need a judge and we do need a king, but we need one who covers all of them and isn't like any other one, a perfect one, a final one. 
And y'all, we have him. I hope you know where I'm going with this. We have him. But the choice is yours this morning. You can still leave and say, you know what, I'm a Christian. But the way I actually act is I trust myself. I trust my mind, my education, my pragmatic ideas, my beauty, my uh, solutions, how prudent I am, uh, whatever it is. And yeah, I'm a Christian as well. Or you're a real Christian who looks over at your Savior and your King, the one who would leave 99 to rescue one, and there's not one person in here who would say that's a good idea. Because gospel isn't math. Gospel isn't math. That's what we do. So the Israelites rejected God. They wanted a system to save them. And it's not going to work, guys. We're going to figure out it's not going to work. Why? Because the king, I told you, every king takes and never do they give. Except one. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he, say it for me, why don't you say that again with me? For God so loved the world that he he, he gave. And when you think about it, Jesus was a taker too. He took your sins on the cross. Not your daughters, not your sons, not your food. Your real problem, your sins. And he died for you forever, once and for all. The old hymn goes like this. How pleased and blessed was I to hear the people cry, Come, let us seek our God today. Yes, with a cheerful zeal, we haste to Zion's hill, and there our vows and honors pay. Zion, thrice happy place, adorned with wondrous grace, and walls of strength embraced, embraced the round. In our tribes appear to pray and praise and hear the sacred gospel's joyful sound. See, they're there for the right reason. And then it says, there David's greater son has fixed his royal throne. He sits for grace and judgment there. He makes the sinner sad to make the saint be glad. And humble souls rejoice with fear. Let's pray. Dear Father, we love you. We thank you for your word today. May everything that we're supposed to get come into our hearts and change us. And everything that's not from you just melt away out of our mind, out of our thoughts. But the real stuff, Father, the hard stuff, the stuff that we don't often really do or agree with, I pray that it, that it weighs upon us and helps us to move into a posture where we don't just say, you know what? I love Jesus, and that's the end of it. We say, and I'm walking with him. The one who rode his horse alone into the battle and was knocked off and killed by the enemy. And then three days later, rises up and says, now, follow me. Yes to victory, but victory that looks like defeat. Your own path may be filled with suffering and loss and bad news. But in the end, we conquer all. It's been done. You're loved. You're kept. You're forgiven. No more weight. But we must, Father, do more than give you lip service. We must actually walk. Walk in that way of death and trust you with the outcomes for our lives. It's in your great and holy name I pray. Amen.